The fate of convicted marathon bomber Jahar Sarnayev is officially in the hands of the nine Supreme Court justices who heard oral arguments yesterday, not about his guilt, that is not being challenged, but about whether his death sentence should be reinstated. That sentence was overturned by a federal appeals court last year after a panel of judges determined the district court failed to properly vet the jury in Sarnayev's original trial and excluded important evidence about a prior murder case involving Sarnayev's older brother. But the Trump administration appealed that ruling and Supreme Court agreed to take up the case, which the Biden administration argued yesterday, despite the fact that they just issued a moratorium on executions three months ago. What we are asking here is that the sound judgment of 12 of respondents' peers that he warrants capital punishment for his personal acts in murdering and maiming uh, scores of innocents and along with his brother, hundreds of innocents at the finish line of the Boston Marathon should be respected. As for Sarnayev's defense, they claim key evidence was blocked from the initial trial, which they argue would have proved the younger Sarnayev played a limited role in the bombings and was heavily influenced by his older brother. The evidence's exclusion distorted the penalty phase here by enabling the government to present a deeply misleading account of the key issues of influence and leadership. A final decision is expected at the end of the court's current term. It's next summer. They're also taking up a number of other high-profile cases, including another challenge to Roe v. Wade, a gun control battle, a fight over alleged discrimination against HIV patients about prescription drugs, and whether to allow public money to fund private religious schools. All of the cases are likely to pit the conservative and liberal factions of the court against each other. At the same time, concern is growing over perceived politicization of the Supreme Court. Joining me to discuss all this is retired federal judge Nancy Gertner. She's now a senior lecturer at Harvard Law School. She's also a member of President Biden's Supreme Court Commission, which is studying the possibility of court expansion, term limits, and more, the work of which, sadly for me and you, she can't talk about until the final report is out. Despite all that, Nancy Gertner, it's good to see you. I feel like saying I can't say anything, but I will. <laughs> so, Judge, you have to explain this to me if you can. Candidate Joe Biden says he was against the death penalty. As I mentioned a minute ago, President Joe Biden's Department of Justice declared a moratorium on the death penalty, yet his Justice Department team in the Sarnayev case is arguing that the death penalty should be reinstated. Uh, uh, how do you reconcile all this? I can't. Uh, I think th the most that you can say is that if there is, if the death penalty, first of all, if the death penalty is reinstated here, the case actually goes back to the Court of Appeals, which left, no, which did not deal with numbers of issues that had been raised by the defense. So this, this is not the end of the line, no matter what. The only thing I could say is that he wants Zernayev on death row in limbo, uh, which seems to me not a meaningful social policy at all. Well, speaking of limbo, actually, it appears, I assume this is not that common, you're on sort of the same page as Justice Coney Bar uh, Barrett, who yesterday had this to say during oral argument. I'm wondering what the government's end game is here. So the government has declared a moratorium on executions, but you're here defending his death sentences. And if you win, presumably that means that he is relegated to living under threat of a death sentence that the government doesn't plan to carry out. I think she nailed it, didn't she? I mean, I don't, still don't understand the rationale, but that is the state of affairs, no? If they win? She nailed it, although it's interesting. I mean, that is not remotely a a legal question. <laughs> um, but no, I think that that's, what <laughs> that's, that is, that is, that's an interesting, it's an interesting question. It was not necessarily for her to ask, but it was an interesting question. So if you can't reconcile those things, since as a judge, you often had to uh, weigh through both sides of an argument, play the Biden administration, what would their explanation be if they were here as to why they proceeded with this? And if they win, they end up with a death sentence, for uh, which they oppose, for Sarnayev. Well, the only thing I can think of, uh, and you see this a lot in the, in the uh, Merrick Garland administration of the, attorney, of the Attorney General's office, is that they see themselves as not the final word. They've only put a moratorium on the death penalty. And so arguably, right. another president could lift that moratorium and they may well be saying that in the universe of people 
who should get the death penalty, he's at the top. Um, but it, it certainly is inconsistent with what Biden has said. Hell of a commitment to principle, I should say. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the court appeared split, to me at least, from what I read, along political lines in the oral argument. And speaking of politics, here are justices from both sides of the aisle talking about an aisle that they say doesn't even exist. Here they are. It isn't really right to say that it's political in the ordinary sense of politics. I think that when we do that and we begin to venture into uh, political, uh, uh, the legislative or executive branch lanes, those of us, particularly in the federal judiciary with lifetime appointments, are asking for trouble. And Coney Barrett went even further, as you know, standing next to Mitch McConnell, I think in Kentucky, I'm not sure, says we are not partisan hacks. Are they partisan hacks? Well, take out the hacks. Are they partisan? It seems to me it is so obvious it's almost embarrassing to ask. Well, he, he, what, what Breyer said was interesting. They're not political in the, quote, ordinary sense of the word. And one of the other things that Coney Barrett said was that, in fact, the positions they take reflect different judicial philosophies. Uh, both are right. They're not political in the ordinary sense of the word. You're subject to the mores of the of the court, you're subject to the rules of the road. Uh, they're not political in the ordinary sense of the word. Um, and, uh, you know, and, but, the, but the problem with the new appointees to the court is that whatever the label, their rulings have mapped onto uh, Republican positions on economic rights, on labor issues. Their rulings have mapped onto that in a rather direct way way. It may be a product of different judicial philosophies, but they were selected for judicial philosophies that enable those positions. And, and as I wrote in a Boston Globe op-ed a few weeks, a week ago, um, they're also determined to overturn precedent at rather breakneck speed. Uh, Coney Barrett, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, uh, Justice Thomas have taken the position that they precedent is important unless it interferes, unless it's inconsistent with their view of the Constitution. So the, the, or the judges certainly are subject to different rules and professional mores. It's not a one-to-one -one correlation between your political views and what you think the law requires. But this group of judges is coming very close to that one-to-one -one correlation, very, very close. By the way, your op-ed was great. People should read it. You know, speaking of precedent, their lack of uh, concern for it, at least uh, in many cases, uh, Roe v. Wade is, what, almost 50 years old. I think everybody watching knows that there is a case coming out of Mississippi which bans abortions after 15 weeks, which is obviously pre-fetal viability, the criterion laid out in Roe v. Wade. That's going to be heard on December 1st. That comes on the heels of a 5-4 to four decision not to stay the even more extreme Texas case. I have to say, I don't want this to be the outcome. I don't think they could possibly be sending a clearer sign than they sent in the five to four uh, well, ruling, uh, 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 refusing to stay that case, that their intention is to either gut or totally repeal Roe v. Wade. Convince me I'm wrong. I can't convince you that you're wrong. It's troubling on so many levels, okay? It's troubling on the ultimate level, which is the reversal of Roe v. Wade on which women have been relying for 50 years. Um, but it's also the way that this is being done. The Texas law, the notion that the Texas law was allowed to go into effect when it is unconstitutional on its face and allowed to go into effect with Alito just allowing it, uh, not intervening, just allowing it without a decision. And the next day the court issues a one paragraph decision. We do not disrespect 50-year-old precedents of this court to this degree. So it's not just that, that the, 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 the law is in jeopardy, the case is in jeopardy. It's also being dealt with with a degree of dismissiveness, which, uh, which is outrageous. Well, let me put it another way. How could the same court that allowed the Texas law to stand, at least temporarily, also come out and reaffirm Roe v. Wade. I, don't, I, I can't 
Well, there's a technical reason. The Texas law, uh, and, and I don't think that this is true, but the Texas law, because, of, because it enabled uh, uh, private parties to enforce it. Bounty hunters, the, yeah. Right, yeah. but force the plaintiffs to sue the clerk of court, the judge who would be accepting the papers, um, basically had to deal with official figures, and they also had one private party. And there was an arguable case that judges are immune uh, from these kinds of cases. And so uh -huh. the procedural issue arguably tied them up. It's a procedural issue that, in my view, was lame. And certainly, even if there were issues about it, certainly is not, the, the, the injunctions are a balance and test can't be outweighed by the plain unconstitutionality uh -huh. of it and the impact on thousands of women. You know, speaking of women, uh, you know, uh, and well, I'll get to women in a second. Uh, Clarence Thomas barely spoke for decades. And then all of a sudden he started asking questions. And I was wondering what went on. And then I read a little bit. I know you know this. I didn't. It's because they changed the rules about you. Instead of just yelling out questions at random, whatever you want, they go down the list from Supreme Court justice down, I assume, based on seniority. So I guess he felt he had to speak or it'd be ridiculous. But yesterday, uh, Justice Sotomayor said at NYU Law School, where I went, uh, that the reason for that, that change in the oral argument, was because studies showed that women justices were being talked over, not just by advocates, but by their fellow male justices. You're nodding in agreement, meaning in a, no surprise. Yeah, I, I, was, I was a one judge in a courtroom, so I never had that. But I had lawyers who, if they didn't think I agreed with them, started to talk more loudly. It's, it's what you know, sometimes what you do to someone who's not speaking English and you think that if you say it loud enough, they'll understand. <laughs> that happened to me. But yeah, no, of course, everyone has, uh, everyone, every woman I know has been through that. So, um, and if it makes Clarence Thomas speak, I suppose that's a good thing. By the way, that thing you described is an old George Carlin routine. If you missed it, you should uh, listen to it about speaking louder when you're speaking to someone who doesn't speak the language. It's actually pretty funny. Before you go, uh, let's stay closer to home with a justice who lives about a mile from my house, Stephen Breyer. First, I want to play for you. Here he is being noncommittal in a conversation with NPR's great Nina Totenberg about retiring. And then here he is with me in 2015 saying on this show saying he was open to term limits. Here's Justice Breyer. When exactly I should retire or will retire uh, has many complex parts to it. I think I'm aware of most of them and uh, I am and will consider them. There should be a long tenure. Whether it's a term of years or not, maybe it would be better to have a term of years, but it must be long. Okay, I know I can't ask you about term limits in general. I know I can't ask you about expanding the court because of the commission. But I can ask you about Stephen Breyer. Should he resign? And people, I assume, know the argument is that if it turns out the Senate is taken over by the Republicans in 2022, Mitch McConnell's basically made it clear there will not be a hearing on a Biden nominee should uh, Breyer retire or obviously die. And then there could be a Republican president in 2024. Should Breyer retire? He's a very dear friend, and I think the answer is yes. And the answer is yes because this is a court you know, you asked before about whether this is a partisan court. When a court is so overwhelmingly in one direction, it is inevitable that, that your personal opinions, that your partisan preferences will, will come to play because they can. Because it, you don't have to persuade anyone. You don't have to struggle with anyone. And if we wind up with another appointment that is like Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, or Barrett, or indeed Thomas or, or Alito, then there will not be compromise on that court. There will not be the back and forth that you don't usually expect because everyone will be everyone else's echo chamber. And that's troubling. Before you go, uh, I've only met Justice Breyer here and he was quite the gentleman. How would your dear friend uh, respond if he were to hear you tonight saying he's a dear friend, but yes, he should retire? I don't think he'd be happy about it. I don't think he'd be happy about it, but. Um, you know, as I said, it, it, he's been a wonderful judge and he's a superb human being. Um, but the, the, it really does relate to the partisan of the court. If you have a court 
of, you know, two other people, let's say it's a three judge court who look and talk mm -hmm. like you. you, you don't really have, you're not really challenged. You don't really have to compromise. You don't really have to accommodate. Um, so th th there is a risk that we're going to wind up with a court that is, you know, as it is now, at least three of the justices were recommended by the Federalist Society, have very similar views. Mm -hmm. And it would be, it would not be a good thing for any of us if the rest of the court was like that as well. Judge Gerdner, I hope to see you right after the commission issues its final report, but it's great to see you tonight. Thanks so much for your time. <laughs> okay. Take care.